Something about it makes me happy. Doesn't matter, spring or fall. Barber Bills, where the music is happening. I can't wait till Barber Bills. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait till Barber Bills. Hi everybody, my name is Deborah West. I'm the executive director here at the Barberville Pioneer Settlement and I'd like to welcome you today to our History Matters series. We're putting these videos together for parents and teachers and students to get you out of your virtual classroom and bring you on to a virtual mini field trip here at Barberville Pioneer Settlement. As you can see, we're practicing the social distancing and today we want to talk to you about the history of the railroad here in Florida. And what better place is there to show you the history of the Florida Railroad than at the Pearson Railroad Station. All aboard! Welcome to the Pearson Train Depot and Caboose here at the Barberville Pioneer Settlement in Barberville, Florida. Prior to the 1830s, in order to travel here in what was soon to be the central part of the state of Florida, the only way you could travel was by horseback or horse-drawn carriage or wagon, or maybe even coming down on the steamship that came down from Jacksonville to Volusia and then taking a stagecoach across. But once the Iron Horse came, which was soon after the Second Seminole War in the, um, after the 1830s, why then the Iron Horse transportation was here. And it played an important part in every aspect of life. During the 1880s, the state of Florida was trying to develop as much of the state as possible. And in order to do so, it needed to create better transportation. The state chartered 60 railroad companies by 1885, offering a bonus of land grants that ranged from 5,000 to 10,000 acres per mile of track laid as an attraction for investment by wealthy businessmen. As a result of the land sales to individuals and land companies and the awarding of land to canal and railroad companies, almost all of the state was open for development by the turn of the century. And in comes Henry Flagler in 1881. Now, Henry Flagler was a wealthy businessman, made his money in oil up north. And unfortunately, his wife Mary came down with what was called consumption, or what we know today as tuberculosis. Now, Mary, um, what they wanted to do with patients like Mary was that they wanted to send them to a warmer climate, especially in the winter. And so many of the wealthy people up north would come down south and they would spend the winter here. So when Mary came down with consumption, Henry Flagler got on a steamship, came all the way down the coast, and landed in St. Augustine. And St. Augustine at that time was a fledgling community. Um, it certainly did not have hotels to the standard of Henry Flagler. So he decided to build a hotel uh, for his wife to be able to stay in. And then as a good businessman, he decided, well, I could have all of my friends coming down here in the winter as well. And if I built a railroad that went from Jacksonville to Tampa to Key West, why, I could make a fortune. And being the good businessman that he was, he knew that he needed to have a, a something on those trains going back north. So he went around to all of the farmers here, got their produce, their citrus, and the lumber, the three main industries that were here in the central Florida area in the 1880s. He loaded all of that product on and sent it back north, and thereby creating the footprint of the railroads that were going to be here in central Florida in the 1880s. The number of miles of railways increased from 518 miles in 1880 to 2,489 miles in just 10 years, going up to 1890. And the population grew by over 45% in Florida, adding over 120,000 residents during that same time period. Key West was the most populated city, followed by Jacksonville and Tampa. 
In order to get to these most populated cities, there needed to be a rail line in between connecting them. And here is where Barberville and the Jacksonville-Tampa Key West Railroad comes into play. This station was built in 1885 as one of the many rail lines built during that initial development of the rail system in the state. But only two years later, it was sold to the Jacksonville-Tampa Key West Railroad. By 1891, the Palatka in Indian Railway was chartered to connect the JTKW Railway with the Florida Southern Railroad at Sanford. It was in an effort to take all of the traffic off of the St. Johns River to take that competition away from the ferry boat system. Businesses changed hands frequently in the late 1800s, and it was only two years later, in 1893, that the Jacksonville-Tampa Key West went bankrupt and was sold to the Savannah, Florida Western Railroad, which was then incorporated into the Atlantic coastlines in 1902, which all merged into the Seaboard Coastline Railroad, also known as the Family Line System, in 1967. Whew, that was a long history, but we finally have come to the company that owned the station when the settlement saw the, an opportunity to obtain a grand building for the new village being built behind the schoolhouse. Railroads became a lifeline for all those new residents of the state. Not only did it give them a means of transportation to travel about and to move their produce, citrus, and lumber, but it was more than that. I dove down into the archives here at the museum and found a newspaper article. This is written by a man by the name of Carl Allen. Unfortunately, I don't have the date or where the newspaper came from. But in it, he is talking about the train depot of yesteryear. And he wrote, I don't know of any one thing that has played a more important part in our history than the old depot has. It was not just a place where a train would stop to take on or put off passengers, but it was the depot that would decide where a town or city would be or not be. It became the backbone of every city or town. It brought in the mail and carried it out, and to many of us it was where the mail order packages would come and it was where the people would go on a Sunday afternoon to meet the train. Folks didn't go just to see who got off or on the train, but to see each other in fellowship. It was also where we went when a hurricane was coming, for then the agent would post the progress of the storm on the bulletin board outside the office. Had it not been for this, we would never have known when or where the hurricane was to hit. The word depot was a magic word in most every town. It usually furnished us with a bathroom, a place to go during a storm, a shade when it was hot. I wonder how many checker games have been played in the shade of those old depot platforms. By 1980, the Pearson Depot was no longer in use by the railroad and was sitting derelict on the side of the tracks. Laura Bell, one of the founding members of the Pioneer Settlement for the Creative Arts and the first president and director of the museum, contacted the Seaboard Coast Lines to see if we could obtain the old station. After a lengthy correspondence, the depot building was donated to the settlement on December 9, 1981, though they still had to raise the money needed in order to move the building. Laura wrote that the settlement was able to comply with the terms of the agreement and describe the next fundraiser to raise those funds. In a letter to the Seaboard Coastline dated July 7, 1980, she wrote, Our next fundraising project will be August 9th and 10th, a summer harvest festival, at which time we will butcher a spring lamb, begin tanning the hide, use the tallow for candles, the small intestines for sausage casings, and freeze the meat. Another sheep will be sheared, the wool washed, vegetable dyed, spun, and woven into a finished product by the end of the two days. While all this is going on, there will be entertainment consisting of a gramophone concert, other demonstrations of farm li living, 
such as butter churning, soap making, etc. There will be country music through the day and a hoedown when the work is done on Saturday night. Our menu will consist of smoked turkey, swamp cabbage, both cooked and as a salad, corn on the cob, watermelon, fresh made homemade raisin bread, and country butter. It was definitely a production back then in order to put on our uh, festivals, a little different than our fall jamboree now. And so by January 8, 1982, the bill of sale was complete for a corporate donation of the depot to be coming to the Pioneer Settlement. Well, it took two years of fundraising, but by 1982, they'd raised $3,300, and the move was on. The building came right down old Highway 17, which is now Highway 3, right along those railroad tracks, of which the trains that used to come and stop at it, coming up, traffic being stopped as they went from corner to corner, until finally they came to Lemon Road along the back side of the settlement. At that point, they brought it in through the back gate, and now here resides the Pearson Depot here at the settlement. One of the other very important aspects of a train depot was the telegraph. Now, in 1837, Samuel Morse developed his Morse code and a way to be able to communicate across wires and be able to all the way across the country with a transcontinental wire. Prior to that time, if you wanted to communicate with a relative, maybe if you lived in Boston and they lived in San Francisco, you'd have to write a letter. And that letter might take three, four, six months to go from one side of the country to the other. Then we developed the Pony Express, and those were the men that got on the horses. They rode as hard and fast as they could across the countryside, um, changing out at stations, getting a new horse, getting on, taking that mail bag all the way across. And it might take maybe a week for the letter to be able to get across. Now, all of a sudden, we have the first instant communication. You might say this was the early texting form in the late 1800s. There was a code with dots and dashes that Samuel Morse developed that the code operator, and a lot of times it was the station depot uh, agent, or it might have been a woman from town who would come in and they would get that, those messages. Uh, this would also, another interesting part about this was it was developed right around the time of the Civil War. It was the first time that they had instant communication during the war. They even took men, put them in hot air balloons, sent them up into the air with a wire connecting down to the ground so that someone could look up and see the battle and be able to give instant communication to the commanders on the ground in order to have troop movements move in a way that helped win the war. So an uh, interesting fact that the telegraph started not only instant communication like we have with our texting now, but also it helped to win a war. Carl Allen in his newspaper article that I was reading to you earlier stated that um, it was fascinating to be able to go into the depot and see the telegraph operators working and seeing that those sounds were somehow making words. He also commented that during the World Series that it was wonderful that they could go in and get the scores right as it was coming over the wire instead of having to wait two or three days in order to get it through a newspaper. One of the wonderful aspects here in the train station in the depot is the model railroad that was built by volunteers here at the settlement. It is a representation of Western Volusia County, starting from Pearson, going all the way down to Lake Breezeford. It's a wonderful representation of those industries that Flagler was so interested in, in the citrus. Uh, we have hotels for the tourist industry, and we have logging. Uh, a wonderful place to come and see what railroads were like way back when. Children travel with me, a story I will tell. Volusia County Railroad days, crackers know it well. The Jacksonville and Tampa and Key West Railroad line. Rumble down through Pearson, try to stay on time. Train, depot days. Money, power, fortune, fame. Buy your ticket fast, try not to be the last. Train, depot days. 
Brothers and family settled here Grow the fern so green Sell the crop for money Ship it out on the train In boxes on the platform Load them on the train The work was hard, the weather hot Everybody pray for rain out for the mailbag they throw it through the door of this old train as it goes past Gunter General store he would have made his fortune old Gunter did his best someone accidentally shot him in the chest stop no more nothing much left to see of gunter's general store the ferns that used to pack the train now a highway bound closing down the depot ruin of the town now they move that depot to barberville at last families come to see the way folks lived in the past kids wander through the depot they love that red caboose they'll be inspired by history let imagination loose But what is a depot without track and a rail car? The indomitable Laura Bell was again riding to Seaboard just a few months after receiving the depot to request the donation of a caboose, engine, tracks, a handcar, whatever they might want to donate. And by August of 1983, one year after she first started to request it, Laura was successful in getting a caboose donated. Originally, it was gray and labeled Family Line Systems. It was brought by rail to Barberville, then its iron wheels were replaced with rubbered ones. Tom Youngblood hooked up a tractor and once again drove down Highway 3 to the settlement. Laura, Tom, and settlement president Howard Grisham even rode on the caboose as it made its final journey. By the time the caboose was being replaced on the trains with an automatic sensor system, the brakeman was no longer necessary, so the caboose became obsolete. And at that point, um, it was able for us to be able to get the caboose here at the settlement. Today, the depot is a focal point at the settlement and used in various programs, including our Florida History Field Trip Program, as well as a stage during our fall jamboree and spring frolic. It's continuing the legacy of the depot of the past as a place not only for those passing through, but also as a place of fellowship where the community gathers to share in music, education, and laughter. We thank you all so much for joining us for our History Matters programs, and we hope to see you again at our next building. Please make sure you make in the comments what building here you would like to, us to talk about next. Bye-bye. Bye-bye from the Barville Pioneer Settlement. Thank you so much. Wasn't that great? 
please leave any of your questions or comments um, in the comments part on our Facebook page and we'll be really happy to answer anything that you have. Running a historical village museum is our passion, but it's not cheap. And we need your help, especially now. We have a fundraiser that you can find on our website. It's called the Fund the Gap Fundraiser. And we invite you to go to our website and if you can, if you're in a position to, give generously. Your contributions will help us keep our doors open and keep history alive for future generations. Thank you. Hi everyone, Richard and Jonathan. We're the ones that kind of inherited this thing this year and we're trying to get this thing up and running. As you can see, it's a little rough. We want, first off, we want to thank the volunteers who built this and we're trying to get as much information about them as we can. If you know who these volunteers were that built this model railroad, we sure would appreciate them having their names so we can take care of that and list them on this display. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that we are in desperate need for materials and rolling stock, locomotives, stock, cars, anything you can help us with in order to keep this thing running. At present, we're down to one working engine and we have a bunch of stock cars, but we do need a lot of other assistance. Anything you can do would help us, and we would sure appreciate it. Thank you very much, and enjoy the train. Music is happening. I can't wait to move.